Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's office hour, What's New in Alexio 2, From Seamless Operations to Structured Data Management. My name is Amelia, and I will be your moderator. Before I introduce you to our speaker, I have a few housekeeping items. All participants are automatically on mute throughout the session. We will be using Slack for Q&A, so please take a moment to join us on the community Slack channel, which is copied into the chat box. It's aluxio.io backslash Slack. You can also check your inbox for an invite to Slack. However, if you are having trouble joining Slack, feel free to message me your questions instead, and I'll share it with the group. And you're welcome to submit your questions anytime. You don't need to wait till the end of the presentation. Uh, as a reminder, to ask a question, join the community Slack channel posted into the chat box, or you can message me your questions directly through the GoToWebinar control panel under the Questions tab. Lastly, today's session is being recorded and will be available for on-demand playback. We will email you the link to the presentation as well. That's it for the housekeeping items, so let's meet our speaker. I'm very pleased to welcome Kelvin Jia, who is the founding engineer of Alexio and PMC Maintainer. Kelvin is the co top contributor to the Alexio open source project. He has been involved as a core maintainer and release manager since the very early days when the project was known as Tachyon. Calvin has a bachelor's in science from UC Berkeley. Without further ado, please welcome Calvin. Hey everyone, I'm um, glad to be uh, giving this office hour uh, with you guys. Uh, today I'm going to be presenting what's new in uh, Luxio 2. Uh, though since this is an office hour, uh, I'm more looking forward to kind of just answering you guys' questions, uh, any specifics that you guys have um, when uh, kind of listening to the presentation. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, first, I kind of wanted to motivate uh, what was the point of uh, Alexio 2 to begin with. You know, why not just keep going with Alexio 1, you can make 1.9, 1.10, and you can keep going. Uh, so as kind of an open source project, we have these high-level requirements, uh, so to speak, when developing the software and uh, making sure that the software is compatible with uh, previous versions and things like that. And over time, we interact with many uh, users in the community, and they kind of come with various different requests. And sometimes these requests are pretty straightforward, like this bug is not, um, like this, this, there's a bug in the system and it, it doesn't work in this certain case. Uh, but other times, uh, they're much more high level. Like, I want to try to run this workload uh, that's 10 times uh, what we originally expected the system to be able to handle. Um, or I'm trying to deploy Alexio in a completely different way, uh, no longer kind of on-prem, but um, with all of these uh, new frameworks in the cloud. And when these types of uh, really uh, high level uh, requests come in, uh, we kind of start gathering them and over time, we decide whether or not it makes sense to kind of upgrade Alexio to a new version because uh, there's a, such a dramatic shift in what what the system itself is uh, being focused on. Uh, so from Alexio 1 to Alexio 2, these were kind of the directions that uh, we took from the community and uh, finally decided, oh, it's time to make a new major release. The first of these was having seamless operations with uh, different cloud uh, services. So with a lot of, with a lot of our users uh, moving towards the cloud these days, there are more and more requests for integrations with, for example, uh, Amazon or Google's uh, different cloud frameworks. And in addition, uh, different kind of orchestration frameworks like uh, Kubernetes or Mesos, uh, those are all kind of becoming more and more important for our users. Another direction was just uh, being able to manage data more intelligently. Uh, in Alexio 1, we kind of just store data and serve data, and that's, that's it. We promise basically fast um, and like performance I.O. Uh, but with more and more uh, people using Alexio and putting more and more data into Alexio, they've been asking for uh, different things that the system could do uh, that their applications might not be privy to. Uh, for example, if multiple applications are using similar data sets, it might be more uh, beneficial to the overall workload to store the data in different ways. Uh, and the last item, and this one really came from kind of the power users from the community, uh, was to just be able to scale the system 
orders of magnitude more than uh, it, it previously could handle. And this came in uh, different dimensions. For example, some users wanted to deal with lots and lots of files, uh, upwards of a billion files, because the way they gather data, each file is really small and they just have a ton of it coming in every uh, minute. Uh, another kind of idea was to be able to scale out the cluster by a lot because um, a lot of users wanted to just use more and more compute nodes in order to do their uh, expensive computing. Uh, so I'm going to go into each of these uh, sections and give a bit more color as to exactly what we've uh, done in Alexio 2 and uh, kind of give you guys an idea of uh, what each of these directions mean. Uh, so first is uh, the idea of seamless operations in the cloud. Uh, we've kind of become cloud native on Amazon. And what that means is we've used the different frameworks that Amazon provides to uh, technologies in order to make deploying on Amazon's platform of pretty much one click. Uh, so this includes uh, having AMIs in the marketplace, uh, which means that you can go and just have a pre-set up um, image of Alexio um, up and running. Uh, another is the cloud formation template. And this is kind of an, like a combination of AMIs so that you can deploy an entire cluster at once instead of just one. Uh, and finally, we've also integrated with uh, the EMR framework in Amazon. Uh, EMR, for those of you who, who may not be as familiar, is uh, means Elastic MapReduce. And that's kind of Amazon's, um, you can think of it as a pre-built uh, computation framework. So a, a lot of the usage with Alexio comes from these different computation frameworks like Spark or Presto or Hive. Um, usually users run like ad hoc querying or they run uh, batch ETL, things like that, and they leverage these compute frameworks. And Amazon EMR is one way to quickly get these up and running. So we're also integrated with EMR so that when you spin up a cluster for doing these operations, you can automatically have Alexio deployed as well. And in, in this graphic is kind of a representation of how that would look with EMR. Um, normally, you just have those compute frameworks, and then you talk to some storage system, for example, S3 if you're using Amazon. And uh, if you use the bootstrap, bootstrap script, then you can uh, automatically have uh, Alexio in that picture as well in order to do data caching and metadata caching. Uh, so naturally, there's more than uh, just one cloud. And uh, we've done this integration with uh, Google Cloud as well. And Google has something called Dataproc, which is pretty much the same as uh, Amazon's EMR, or like the equivalent there. And we've also integrated with their equivalent of the Bootstrap, which is called their init action. And uh, that will be able to deploy Alexio alongside these compute frameworks in uh, Google Cloud. Uh, so outside of uh, just cloud deployments, um, we have uh, another flavor of deployments, uh, which we term native deployments. And this could happen in the cloud or on-prem. Uh, but this is more for users who want to have more control over how they deploy their systems. Uh, so an easy way is to use the provided frameworks uh, already available uh, in the different clouds. Uh, but some people just want to run um, on those cloud, uh, on those clouds as kind of uh, infrastructure. So you just want to ask uh, Amazon or Google or Microsoft for a bunch of machines, and then you want to run your custom applications there. And uh, generally, in that mode, uh, users like to have a cluster manager like Kubernetes or uh, Mesos. Uh, in this case, uh, we've done a much tighter integration with Kubernetes so that uh, you're able to deploy uh, Alexio containers within Kubernetes and have Kubernetes manage those containers uh, without much uh, additional uh, overhead. I think we also have kind of a sample um, Kubernetes recipe in the Helms chart uh, in order to be able to quickly launch uh, these Alexio processes. And we've also integrated with their uh, container storage interface if you specifically want to treat Alexio as kind of a storage system. Uh, so what, one last kind of improvement that we've made in order to be more cloud native or be more friendly to uh, these various uh, deployment mechanisms is to uh, make Alexio's bookkeeping or quorum management uh, self-managed. Uh, so previously in Alexio 1, 
the Alexio system actually relies on a distributed storage, for example, like HDFS, and uh, another distributed system called Zookeeper in order to run in high availability mode. Uh, but that put a lot of restrictions on users' environments because these systems are also uh, distributed systems and it's not easy to uh, deploy them or ensure that they're available. Uh, so in Alexio 2, we've decided to make our quorum uh, self-sustaining. So now all the Alexio masters kind of uh, talk to each other in order to achieve the previous uh, consensus that required the different distributed systems like HDFS and Zookeeper. Uh, and the way we do that is by using an algorithm called Raft, which is uh, a, a simplified version, or so they claim, of uh, Paxos, which is the traditional uh, kind of consensus algorithm. Uh, and so the high-level idea is now we don't have any more uh, external dependencies, so you can take Alexio and deploy it wherever you want without having to worry about, oh, do I have these other systems in place? Uh, so the next section I want to talk about is how we scaled the architecture to uh, orders of magnitude uh, above what we previously could handle. Uh, so the first in these dimensions was being able to scale to uh, billions of files. And the high-level challenge was each uh, file that we keep track of in Alexio takes an amount of space uh, on the Alexio master. And in general, it was about one kilobyte per file. So doing some back of the envelope calculation, it's going to take about a terabyte of heap space uh, in order to store one billion files. And uh, since we're using a Java-based uh, system, then it becomes a big problem when the garbage collector kicks in and it needs to clean up a bunch of that uh, memory in order to make space for new memory. And uh, that kind of just uh, stalls the entire system and makes it unresponsive for a very long period of time. Uh, so naturally, we weren't able to rely on the Java heap in order to scale to a billion files. Instead, what we decided to do was add a new tier of storage uh, with a, a, a system called RocksDB, and we embedded this within Alexio, meaning you don't actually need to run a RocksDB instance. It comes with the Alexio software. And what RocksDB does is it's just a key value store that stores our uh, files or our inode tree on disk. So it's uh, outside of the Java heap and doesn't need to be managed by the garbage collector. Uh, and in addition to have uh, good performance, we also have an in-memory cache similar to what we previously had in order to um, store inodes that were frequently accessed. So the response for general requests would still be very fast. And it, with this combination, we're able to scale to a much uh, larger number of files, um, probably over 1 billion easily, and still have a good performance comparable to our uh, previous implementation. Uh, so a, a bit more details as to um, how this looks from an architecture perspective. Uh, what we have is uh, this big box represents the Alexio master node, and inside the small square represents the Java process. And inside the Java process, there's important information like the cached files, as well as uh, some of the lookup tables, as well as the locks, so I items that get accessed very frequently. And then on local disk, what we have is a RocksDB table, um, actually uh, several RocksDB tables. Well, we've split out uh, kind of the structure of our tree in order to better fit the uh, key value store that RocksDB provides. So for example, here, uh, we would have a table of inode IDs to uh, their raw metadata. So this would be kind of a number and then a mapping to the one kilobyte or so of metadata that we store per file. Uh, and in order to kind of connect all of these I, uh, inodes or uh, kind of files together or files or directories together, we have another table called the edge table, which just maintains all of the links uh, between these different inodes. So in, in this uh, example, you can see that there's an edge called um, 12, uh, 12395, uh, 12392, and um, its child name is foo. So that points to what the uh, ID of foo would be. So you are able to kind of uh, quickly uh, look down at the tree by accessing the edges in the table. 
so another direction that we wanted to scale the system was just our inter process communication, which would allow us to scale to uh, larger clusters as well as uh, more clients. Uh, previously in Alexia 1, we were using uh, two different transport frameworks in order to do inter-process uh, communication. Uh, one of these was called Thrift for uh, the different metadata operations, and another one was uh, Netty in order to do data transfer. Both of these were relatively low level uh, communication frameworks, which worked well for uh, giving us fine control over the performance of, the, of, of these um, RPC calls, but it didn't allow us to easily scale the system as well as uh, had limitations in the number of clients that could be connected to the system. So in Alexio 2, we decided to move to a new kind of, well, I wouldn't say new, but um, a more, um, a, a newer type of framework called uh, gRPC. And the kind of, the, the advantage that gRPC has over um, frameworks like Thrift and Netty is that it's at a higher level uh, than these frameworks. So it, it allows you to kind of um, represent the different uh, inter-system uh, or inter-process communication at a, a higher level and lets you uh, manage uh, these connections in an easier way. Uh, so for, for example, like gRPC itself is written on top of Netty. Uh, so it has a lot of the benefits that uh, Netty previously provided. Uh, just it provides an easier way to work with Netty. So you don't have to be writing lots of low level code or uh, managing lots of low level connections. And because uh, gRPC has really good connection management, uh, we don't need to uh, kind of scale up the physical um, system, like the hardware, in order to support uh, more, uh, more clients or more workers in the system. Uh, as a concrete example, previously, when you make a connection to the Alexio master, you need to open a network socket. Uh, but with gRPC, you actually are able to share that network socket with any other uh, threads that are talking to the Alexio master uh, within your process. So previously, if you're running a, a multi-threaded process, let's say 32 threads, uh, you might need to open 32 connections to the master uh, because each of those threads is talking to the master. Uh, but with gRPC, they each still have their own connection, but now they're using the same physical uh, network socket. So that greatly reduces the number of open sockets uh, that are required on the Alexio master. So in the last uh, direction that we took the system, uh, we decided to take a look at the data that we're managing and see if there are ways that we could uh, manipulate or better place that data in order to accelerate or improve the uh, workloads that our users were running. Uh, so one major workload that users were running was uh, Presto, which is kind of a, a, a big data SQL framework. And uh, in order to better support these Presto users, we hooked into uh, Presto's kind of uh, plugin in order to uh, integrate different uh, storage systems. And it, it, this is called the Presto Alexio connector. Uh, and with this connector, we've introduced a new Alexio service called the Alexio catalog service. And the idea here is instead of keeping track of just files, we also start keeping track of a higher level concept like tables as well as columns. And uh, with this new information, we're able to make smarter decisions about how we want data to be stored. Uh, so previously in Alexio 1, when someone's using Presto, all we understand is we're reading a, a file or we're reading a part of a file. But now with the catalog service, we actually can understand that these set of files represent a table and uh, this table has this schema. Um, and once we understand uh, information like that, in addition to uh, this user is querying this table on these keys or uh, kind of grouping by these keys or filtering on these keys, uh, we can make uh, decisions that will benefit the user's query patterns. So uh, what, one example is a lot of users kind of have raw data in um, kind of plain text format like sequence files or uh, CSV files. And we're able to, in the background, transform that into Parquet so that from 
the query engine's perspective, it's still accessing the table. Um, but in the background, instead of accessing those uh, kind of naive files, it's accessing a format like Parquet or ORC that's a lot more optimized for the type of querying that it's going to do. Uh, another form of data management or data transformation that we we're looking into is a policy uh, driven uh, engine. And where this stems from is uh, less from users wanting uh, kind of their data to automatically be optimized, but more from users who say, oh, I actually know exactly what I want to do with my data. Uh, I want my data to be stored on my uh, warm storage uh, in the last 30 days, and once uh, 30 days have passed, I want to move it over uh, to a cold storage archive. Uh, so in this example, uh, we have a policy of if the file is older than 90 days, we want to move it from the warm storage HDFS into the cold storage S3. And uh, with the Alexio policy-driven data management, uh, you're able to specify that, and Alexio will automatically take care of this migration for you in the background. Uh, so here, uh, let's say after the first 90 days, uh, the first block is being uh, moved over to S3, and uh, so on and so forth. And one interesting thing to know here is, um, at the end of this example at least, all of the data actually has been moved from HDFS into S3. Uh, so you can imagine using this system in order to facilitate uh, migrating even between two storage systems, because now that all the data is moved over, you can actually just uh, spin down this HDFS cluster. Uh, and the last kind of uh, management feature I wanted to talk about is the idea of being able to uh, replicate writes in order to support uh, asynchronously writing data. Uh, so before I uh, go to uh, the details of how this works, the motivation for this is a lot of users are using Alexio with Object Store, and Object Store does not kind of store files well uh, with different compute frameworks. Uh, the reason being, one is just uh, the operation is a bit slower because it's, it's further away. And another is a lot of these compute frameworks actually will do a lot of file modification, for example, renaming files or deleting files uh, in a very short period of time and then kind of stop using those files. So what you really want to do is kind of put these really uh, hot files in a temporary or fast uh, file system like Alexio. And then only after all of these different operations are completed, then write back the final data into your object store. Uh, because doing a bunch of renames and deletes on the object store is going to be a, a lot more costly. Uh, so the, the natural downside to doing this is you might lose your data if one of these um, systems goes down. So that's why we need to do a replicated write. And the, the way the replicated write works like this, the Alexio client will first write to the Alexio workers, and the Alexio workers will kind of replicate it among themselves um, with some number of copies. And all of these operations are going to be pretty fast. Uh, then, after a, a period of time, uh, kind of after the compute framework has finished uh, touching these files, uh, the Alexio worker will be responsible for writing back the final data into the underlying storage, in which case, uh, if it's an object storage system, it will benefit a lot from having uh, not to deal with all of the different operations and writes. And kind of the high level idea is you can have uh, really quick writes to the Alexio system, um, but then later on have your data automatically persist persisted for you. Uh, and that's all, kind of all of the different uh, directions I wanted to talk about. Uh, if you guys had any questions, uh, feel free to put them on Slack, and uh, I'll, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you, Calvin. We have our first question here. Um, if I'm planning to deploy Alexio in the cloud, which compute framework would you suggest for doing ad hoc query analytics? Uh, okay, so if you're running Alexio in a cloud, for, for example, you're running Amazon and you don't already have like a favored stack, uh, I, I would suggest to use like Amazon EMR or like Google Dataproc because these are these kind of frameworks are able to get you uh, started with 
uh, kind of just just running your computer or uh, kind of getting something started uh, very quickly without having to deal with deploying those by themselves. And then uh, specifically, which compute framework? Uh, I think Alexio has a pretty strong integration with Presto right now for uh, SQL queries. Uh, and if you are more inclined to use uh, like Spark SQL, I, I think Alexio also uh, works well there. Great. Uh, our next question here, <clears throat> excuse me, what's the benefit of decoupling Alexio from other software in the ecosystem? Isn't it better to work together with more systems and leverage uh, the work that they have done? Uh, okay, so I, I guess this is uh, probably referring uh, back to the part uh, where we were talking about kind of removing the dependencies on uh, different uh, external systems like Zookeeper or HDFS. Uh, and I think Al Alexio is um, really uh, definitely like a ecosystem integration uh, type of system where by itself it doesn't do that much, but with the combination of different systems, it can uh, greatly improve that workload. Uh, what we were uh, talking about previously was more about uh, making sure that Alexio isn't reliant on anything in particular because it's already tough to have one distributed system. And if you say your distributed system uh, comes with two more distributed systems, uh, it becomes really difficult uh, for users to uh, deploy that in, a, uh, in, in, a, in in any environment. It has to be like pretty specific or they have to already be using uh, those softwares. Great, our next question here is, how exactly does the data transformation, um, how is it achieved using Alexio? Uh, and then in quotations, a uh, CSV to Parquet, for example. Uh, oh yeah, uh, so that's that's a good question. The idea um, behind Alexio is we already have uh, access to a, a lot of the data um, that the users uh, are accessing. So uh, we probably already have, uh, for example, those CSV files uh, stored in Alexio somewhere. And uh, there's another component of Alexio called the job service which you can think of as a very lightweight compute framework that can do uh, operations on behalf of the Alexio system. Uh, so what would happen is we would see these uh, CSV files and after a certain amount of querying, uh, we might kick off a job in the job service, which would uh, read those CSV files, which are already uh, probably stored in Alexio space and uh, do a transformation. Uh, and th in this case, transformation is just going to be like read the data and then write it out in uh, a different format. Uh, for example, it would transform from CSV to Parquet. And then we would write that data out into uh, another location in Alexio, which is kind of our like Alexio hidden directories. And once we, we finish that um, kind of transformation, we would use the catalog service to redirect requests uh, from uh, of that table to the new transformed data, like the Parquet data, as, as opposed to uh, previously going directly to the CSV or um, plain text. Great. Um, our next question, the metadata server, will it be able to replace Hive for Presto or do we still need it for Presto? Uh, yeah, so the catalog service in one way um, kind of takes the place of the Hive meta store, uh, but in, in another way, uh, you still need the Hive meta store to be kind of your source of truth. Um, the Alexio catalog service actually has the ability to mount Hive meta stores uh, for example, uh, similar to how you would be able to mount a file system with uh, Alexio. Uh, so I guess to answer the question, you still need a Hive Metastore, but your Presto service will likely not be talking to that Hive Metastore anymore. Is aggregating too many, also aggregating too many files into few files? How is it achieved? Uh, yeah, that's uh, very similar to um, how we decide to um, kind of transform CSV to Parquet. Uh, the idea is uh, when there's a, a bunch of small files, like for example, your files are in the megabytes, like few megabytes, and you have like hundreds of them, uh, we notice and kind of the general idea is uh, it's not performant for uh, query engines to access. Uh, so we have a heuristic of uh, once we see that there are a certain number of files in the partition, uh, we will read those files and rewrite that as one single large file. And there's a different um, kind of knobs as to determining when that process should be triggered as well as uh, kind of how large uh, of files to write out. 
how can I control the number of replicas with replicated writes? What happens if I lose a replica? Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's a really good question. Um, so the main idea behind replicated writes is to uh, make sure that you don't lose data. So uh, different users will have different tolerances. What we've seen is generally uh, users like to have uh, two replicas uh, when they're writing data for jobs that can uh, be rerun, and uh, probably three or five for data that is very difficult to rerun. So that's a kind of an option that when the user is uh, writing data, they can specify. So that would be in like your Alexio properties or something like that, um, where it says like number of replicas um, to, to have. Uh, and then once that replic replication has been uh, done, uh, Alexio actually also has a background process to kind of uh, monitor the health of uh, different replicas. So if you end up losing a node, that, that health check service will pick that up and uh, immediately try to re-replicate that data into another um, node. So kind of even if you lose a node, there'll only be a shorter, short period of time where that replication factor is not being respected. So you really would have to lose pretty much n number of nodes at the same time in order to um, get in the situation of data loss. Great questions, uh, keep them coming. So our next question here is, is structured data going to have more future, uh, features in the near future? Um, yeah, so a structured data, this definitely is kind of like a, a initial uh, preview or kind of like the first uh, version of it. Uh, we're definitely going to be uh, improving it, especially with uh, user feedback. Like one of the um, kind of big uh, types of user feedback that we've gotten is uh, to be able to do um, more write operations with the structured data management. Uh, currently, this version is more focused on just read operations, but some users also want to uh, write uh, different temporary tables, for example. And that's uh, definitely something we're looking into. Uh, but yeah, I would expect a, a lot of development on structured data in Alexio 2 as, as a whole. Uh, is the high availability mode in 2.0.0 independent of Zookeeper? Uh, yeah, so uh, high availability in Alexio 2 can be run uh, without Zookeeper, uh, so that's with the self-managed quorum. Uh, but if you're coming from Alexio 1 and you've already set up all of that high availability and you don't want to deal with having to switch to uh, something new and uh, possibly unknown, uh, you guys can still use the old high availability mode, uh, which uses like something like Zookeeper and another distributed storage system. Great. So those are the questions we have so far. You're welcome to keep submitting. Oh, here we have our next question. In 2.0.0, don't we need a shared file system for storing Alexio master data? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a good question. Uh, so previously in Alexio 1, uh, we used a shared file system in order to store uh, the Alexio master data, in, in which case um, it, it's mostly the journal file, so to be able to recover uh, after restarting or um, if the system goes down. Um, in Alexio 2, we actually don't need that shared storage system anymore because we've kind of created a store, a ship, like a distributed storage just among the different Alexio masters and their local storage. Uh, so uh, previously, when we were talking about uh, using a uh, consensus algorithm, uh, we we're able to use something like Raft in order to decide among all of those um, Alexio masters kind of agree on, oh, this is the current Alexio master state. Great. So we have uh, some more time here if anyone else has uh, additional questions. Uh, and in the meantime, Kelvin, based on some of the questions asked, is there anything that you would like to expand on or mention? Um, I guess like well, what, one thing, um, I, I noticed like a lot of questions about kind of the transformation uh, engine as well as like uh, the structured data as a whole. Um, and that's definitely one area that uh, I really would encourage um, users to go out and try because it is a new kind of space um, that Alexio is moving into. And we've gotten uh, feedback from users uh, as to how they would like to see uh, it being developed as well as how that would help them the most. And uh, I think if, if you are interested in uh, uh, using features like that, this is a really good time to kind of get on the early train and uh, be able to influence like more of uh, what the direction uh, the project goes with it. Great, thank you for that. 
I really appreciate everyone joining today's office hour. We're going to be hanging out for another 10-15 minutes in case anyone else has questions. Oh, and here we go. In future releases, is there any chance to add native support for Apache Arrow? Yeah, uh, Apache Arrow um, is extremely uh, interesting project, and um, we've been uh, thinking a lot about like what's the best way to integrate with Arrow. Uh, if you have a kind of a specific idea of uh, what you what you mean by having like native support for Apache Arrow, uh, that that would also be really helpful um, to us to know like what type of integration you're really looking for. Uh, but just off the top of my head, like the different ways the integration could go. Uh, one is we just use Arrow as a uh, in memory storage format. So any application that is already integrated with Arrow could kind of uh, leverage the benefits of uh, being able to, for example, directly access uh, that in memory format uh, when it's stored in Alexio. Uh, but this requires, um, a, it's, it's, it's a bit tricky because it requires the compute framework themselves to also have this integration, and we don't really have a strong control over those compute frameworks. Uh, I know different compute frameworks like uh, Spark are already uh, making kind of uh, initiatives into uh, using Arrow and supporting Arrow, but a lot of those are more internal. Like they're not talking to an external system in order to read Arrow. They're more using it for their kind of internal memory format. These are really great questions, and I encourage folks, if you haven't already, to feel free to join the Alexio Community Slack channel. You can join by uh, going to alexio.io backslash slack, or by checking your inbox, and an invite should be uh, sent to you. And the Slack channel is a great place to get sort of uh, answers to some of these questions and discussions, not only with uh, Alexio core developers, but also with the broader community. So a follow-up to the earlier questions about Arrow uh, example here is that like while using memory tier in Alexio, can we have that option to use it with Arrow? Um, yeah, so that I, I think that's uh, one uh, direction we, we would we would go in. Um, it's a, a little bit tricky for us because um, Alexio uses like care storage, so um, and like the Arrow format really benefits uh, just like staying in memory. So like if uh, we were able we were able to have uh, like a disk representation of that, like it wouldn't be as effective. Um, so like that that would require us to kind of treat the memory tier as uh, very special, which uh, right now we kind of don't, and we say like memory tier just happens to be uh, faster than the other tiers. Uh, but uh, I would definitely want to know more about like if you have a specific use case or a specific uh, integration in mind. Uh, for example, like oh, you have some uh, Python processes and you want to be able to access uh, data uh, through the Arrow format. Another question, uh, is there an option of graceful shutdown in 2.0.0? Uh, graceful shutdown, um, I guess there's, a, uh, I'm, I'm not 100% sure uh, what you mean by graceful shutdown, uh, but one way to interpret that is uh, for example, to shut down a worker and make sure that the worker, um, like important data, for example, the data for replicated writes is already uh, replicated to other nodes uh, before shutting down that worker. And uh, that, that's not something that we currently support, like the idea to decommission a node, but we uh, are definitely looking into um, providing that functionality. All right, so uh, thank you, Calvin, for hosting and presenting in today's office hour. And I really appreciate everybody for joining and for the fantastic questions. Uh, if you have any more questions, feel free to join us in the Slack channel and join the discussions there. Uh, and then if not, we will see you in our next office hour. Oh, hold on, as we speak, we have one last question pop in. Uh, is RocksDB compulsory to use? Oh. Um so RocksDB, um, or like the feature using emb embedded RocksDB is not required. Uh, you can still run Alexio in the old mode, uh, which puts all of the metadata on heap, uh, though there might be scaling limitations. Uh, I think we were fine up to like a couple hundred million files, but more than that would cause like a lot of GC pressure. Uh, though uh, to clarify, like the RocksDB uh, portion is uh, completely internal to Alexio. Um, like, you don't need to deploy a RocksDB uh, system or anything like that. Uh, Alexio handles all of that. Uh, all you need to do is provide uh, some local storage.
Great. Uh, thank you very much. And with that, we conclude today's office hour. See you next time. All right. Thanks, everyone.